Evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Longtown Watershed Council's July webcast. I'm Clinton Begley, Executive Director for the Council. Before we begin, I wanted to first acknowledge that the Longtown Watershed lies within the traditional homelands of the tribes and bands of the Kalapuyan peoples. Following treaties in the 1850s, the Kalapuya were dispossessed of and forcibly removed from their indigenous homeland by the United States government. Today, many descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron and Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. We acknowledge that we are in occupied lands and express our respect for the Kalapuya and all tribal nations of Oregon and the important contributions they continue to make to their communities, including to the stewardship of this watershed. We're also committed to not letting that statement begin and end simply with acknowledgement. We are committed to listening, learning from, and supporting Indigenous peoples. We are working to live that commitment every day. Valuing the collective wisdom of our community and building relationships has been at the core of our approach for almost 25 years, and it will continue to be important moving forward. Our efforts to support and learn from tribal people are no different and directly supports our mission that has guided us and all that we've done for nearly two and a half decades. So thank you for being here for tonight, and I'll turn it over to Rob to take it from here. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Clinton, and welcome everybody, and thank you for tuning in to our July webcast. I'm Rob Hoshaw, the Operations Director for the Longtime Watershed Council. And tonight we're really excited to bring you a two-part presentation on the impacts of a changing climate on the timber and forestry communities. This is uh, the second in, the, in a featured series on how climate change is impacting various communities and stakeholders in our watershed and what folks are doing to meet those challenges. Tonight's presentation will be the first of two broadcasts on this topic with the second coming on Tuesday, August 10th in a couple short weeks. Uh, the first in this series on climate focused topics was back in March when Haley K. Scott talked about the intersection of racial justice and climate change and the unequal impacts that people of color, black people and indigenous people uh, face as a result of that. A future installment coming later this winter will look at the impacts of climate change on the agricultural community. This is an important topic for the Council because forestry is a really significant part of the Longtown watershed. Almost half of the watershed's land area is classified as forestry and it's something that's uh, pretty easy to forget when many of us live and work in the valley floor on the, um, in the agricultural and urban areas. Uh, the products that come from timber are a really important renewable resource that touches all of our lives in a multitude of ways. But climate change is creating challenges for those in the forest and timber community. Uh, we just had an unprecedented heat wave last month that shattered records up and down the Willamette Valley. And then uh, our region and much of the West is in an extreme drought. As we'll learn tonight and then later in a couple weeks on August 10th, these prolonged periods of drought combined with hotter conditions and then intense disturbances are creating additional operational and economic challenges for the people who rely on timber as their way of making a living. Speaking of which, uh, yesterday we shared a video that featured an interview with small woodland owners, Lindsay Reeves and Tom Bowman of Bowman Tree Farm. Uh, they talked about their management goals as timber owners and how a changing climate is impacting their management decisions on uh, their property. And then also Lauren Grand, who is also from OSU Extension as a forestry extension agent. She provided some scientific context for the video. Uh, and there's some great visual information and firsthand accounts that are designed to go along with the program that is featured tonight and then in a couple weeks. Uh, we're really excited to be partnering with Oregon State University Extension Service uh, to bring their expertise to you on this topic. And tonight we are welcoming Dave Shaw and Glenn Howe. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions after each speaker. So go ahead and like our previous webcast, you can enter your questions into the chat comment box directly onto YouTube. And then uh, I will go ahead and moderate those and ask those of the, question of the, uh, of the speaker directly. So first we're going to bring in Dave Shaw. Dave is a biologist and forest health specialist with Oregon State University's Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. And he's a professor at OSU's Forestry Engineering, Resources and Management Program. His areas of expertise and research interests include studying the effects of forest pathogens, insects and diseases. And so he's here tonight to talk about how climate change increases the susceptibility 
of forest infestations and why pests and disease increase with hotter and drier conditions. Welcome, Dave. If you haven't already, go ahead and turn on your camera and microphone and uh, feel free to take it away. We're excited to have you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sharing my screen here and queuing up the talk. Uh, there we go. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and the Long Tom's quite an interesting uh, watershed in the valley. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'd like to talk about climate change and insects and pathogens. It's actually way more complicated than anyone can imagine. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily a very simplistic, straightforward um, sort of interactions that are going on. And I hope I can capture some of the complications associated with this as we go through the evening. Um, this photo here is a classic photo from Southern California, or excuse me, the Southern Sierras in California on the west slope of the Sierras uh, after the 2014 to 2016 drought. It was a very extreme drought in California. They had a, a really incredible die off of ponderosa pine along that uh, western slope. And um, <clears throat> all of this, almost all of this ponderosa pine mortality, which we associated with drought, was also associated with the western pine beetle. And uh, so there's a lot of um, conjecture out there about you know, whether the beetles killed the trees or whether the drought killed the trees or whether it took both to really kill these trees. And we're still struggling to really sort some of that out. But the bottom line is that bark beetle activity is often associated with widespread drought. Uh, we really get too deep into talking about this, I think it's important to remember that uh, tree mortality is actually a normal part of forest processes. Uh, dead trees are really important for various reasons, particularly habitat, biodiversity, and forest resilience. Um, yet, I think what we work about is the rate of mortality and whether the rate of mortality exceeds what we would consider normal or within the bounds of what ecosystems have shown us in the past. And of course, with climate change, all bets are off. We don't really understand how these new environments are really gonna influence uh, the rates of mortality. But just remember that, that all dead trees are not bad. Um, now, what are we really expecting from climate change? And in the short term, uh, we're expecting warmer, wetter winters with um, increased winter temperature, reduced winter snowpack and increased growing season length. So this has implications for, for the vegetation. We're also expecting hotter, drier summers with increased summer temperatures, decreased growing season precipitation, and of course, reduced snow melt. Um, we're also anticipating extreme events such as the heat dome event we had just this last month and these east winds and the fires that we had in the Labor Day uh, 2020. Um, of course, we're also anticipating increased incidence and severity of fire, it, particularly with the hotter, drier summers and, um, and what we call hotter drought, uh, these increased temperatures in when drought is occurring. And then finally, there are, um, some potential benefits from increased CO2 in the atmosphere for plant growth. But in the Pacific Northwest, it seems to be limited by um, nitrogen limitations and drought and the length of the dry season. So the benefits of the CO2 enrichment are limited in our area, we believe. Now, before we, uh, to really talk about what's going to happen with insects and diseases, we want to understand our forest. And just to review, this is the simplified forest map of um, Oregon and the different forest types that are common throughout the region. So along the coast here, we have in blue, we have the Sitka spruce um, hemlock zone, which is a maritime fog influence zone. Uh, the green here is dominated by Douglas fir, but this is often called the Western hemlock type. But it's uh, the Doug, what we know as the Doug fir region. Doug fir tends to dominate that, but Western hemlock and Western red cedar will be common in your old growth stands. Um, in the golden area here, this is the hardwoods, particularly Oregon white oak and um, Oregon myrtle along some of the rivers here. 
Um, and then down in the southern portion here is the Klamath Siskiyou's mixed conifer. And along the higher elevations in the purple here, we get our true fir and uh, spruce forest and also mountain hemlock, true fir mountain hemlock forest, excuse me, not spruce. Um, and then uh, on the east side here, we get our ponderosa pine stands in green, uh, lodgepole pine dominate, dominated stands in these gray areas within the green. And then the black here is uh, Western juniper dominated stands. So these are really, you know, grading into the sagebrush. And then at the higher elevations in the Blue Mountains, we have ponderosa pine and it grades up into the mixed conifer um, which is the yellow and the blues here and the higher elevations in the blue. So these, um, the higher mixed conifer forests and the lodgepole pine here are um, basically above the ponderosa pine zone. Now with climate change then, of course, we're expecting, you know, influences across the region, but it's uh, hard to generalize across the entire region because of the diversity of forest types and the diversity of the landscape and the, and the landscape uh, history. So uh, as we move through this though, I just like to refer back to, you know, what's happening within the state and um, some of the things that we anticipate will, will happen. One of the other things that are really you know, really start talking about insect and disease influences is how these vary with landscape setting of the stands and in mountainous stands, I mean, excuse me, in mountainous landscapes, there's a lot of variation and there's a lot of variation in composition of the forest and a lot of variation in how cold air might move down the mountain. You get these cold air drainage, you get uh, fog and other uh, high humidity areas down where you get a humid air pooling and that kind of thing. And all of these in the past, we used to think of these as these cold, cool air pooling zones as areas where foliage diseases and rust diseases and things might be more important. However, now looking into the future, we're starting to think of these as stand areas where we, the stance might be more buffered from extreme events like heat domes and things like that. But the complications that arise from uh, landscape complexity really makes it difficult to predict how exactly insects and pathogens are going to interact with the forest on a landscape scale. So um, much of what we see might be, you know, patchy at first on various landscapes. Um, so uh, anyway, this is a just another thing to consider as you start thinking about how insects and diseases are gonna be interacting with um, forests in the future and climate change. Another important thing to think about, and this is a west side map of uh, Oregon and Washington, and it has the three, we've lumped things into three age classes here, young trees under 50 years old, which represent about 40%, 41% of the landscape now. Trees that are about 50 to 250 years old, and that's another 53% of the landscape. And that's in yellow there. And you can see it's concentrated down in the Klamath Siskiyou country and along the Cascades. And then the old growth, which is older than about 250 years, only occupies about 7% of the landscape on the west side now. Now, the reason this is important is because particular forest insects and pathogens often predominate in certain age classes of stands particularly young forests, uh, various insects and pathogens can really um, dominate things in younger, in younger forests. And if the, the proportion of the landscape, which is occupied by these various age classes also complicates how insects and diseases are gonna, and forests are gonna respond to climate change. Of course, we know that drought is particularly important. And this is a map from uh, of the US Drought Monitor from July 13th, this, just this week. Um, you can see in Oregon here, the exceptional drought is now occurring across the east side along the sl east slope of the Cascades and down into the Klamath region where we know there's really significant impacts on water. Um, we're starting to see an intensification here in the Willamette Valley in the Southern Willamette region. And of course, down in south, Southwest Washington, excuse me, Southern Oregon here, 
we're seeing some impacts of drought also, and we've been seeing this over the last few years. In the right corner here, this is a, a, a Western USA map from the same day. You can see that in California, things are really starting to look bad. And uh, particularly in the Four Corners region, they're really having a hard time with drought, although the monsoons have started to hit and may uh, moderate some of that effect. However, this is a time series for Oregon starting in 2000 and going through 2000 or to the current um, drought that we're in. And this is the proportion of the state in various levels of drought. Um, so for example, here in early 2000 or in mid 2001 or end of 2001, about 58% of the state was in what we'd call extreme drought. But if you notice, basically since about 2000, all the way through to present, we've essentially been in a drought. We've had some years of no drought, but it's been very few compared to what we've been seeing. So the last 20 years has been really significant in terms of really uh, starting to put the squeeze on the West and on Oregon also from this, from this drought pattern where we seem to be stuck in and which may be the future. Um, now, to really start talking about insect and diseases, of course, we didn't really want to get bogged down in all the specific insects or diseases or pathogens or whatever that are out there. So what I thought would be helpful is just to talk about some of the major pathogen groups and then discuss how these might be affected by climate change. So one of the major pathogen groups, root diseases, and these are um, usually fungi, and uh, there's often associated with stress, although not only through not only stress, but because some of them prefer vigorous trees or vigor doesn't matter, but also root contacts. Then we've got the stem decays. These are wood decays of live trees, often associated with wounding, but can get into trees through branch stops and such. Foliage diseases are another important pathogen group, and these are often associated with precipitation, especially during spring and summer, uh, things that cause leaf wetness. Uh, canker diseases that are pretty common, particularly annual cankers, um, which are caused by fungi and other, uh, caused by fungi, are often associated with stress and wounding. So these can come up during severe droughts. We start to see more of these. Rust diseases are another group. These are uh, specialized fungi that have uh, very complex life cycles. And these are often associated with seasonality of precipitation and they can have wave years during certain years where they're, they really increase in abundance associated with just some key uh, precipitation events during the year. And then finally, the mistletoes. Um, and contrary to what a lot of people might think, mistletoes actually prefer the most vigorous hosts and they're most abundant on the biggest, most vigorous trees. But of course, with time, they may cause a decline in that tree. Um, as far as some of the more important insect pest groups, uh, bark beetles, of course, are one of the number ones. And, and uh, this, again, is related to stress and often is related to stress and low vigor, but they can outbreak and attack healthy trees under current certain conditions. Uh, wood borers that we tend not to think of really primary killers of trees, but we're seeing that in these seriously stressed trees that we've come, been coming across in Western Oregon, the Douglas fir, for example, wood borers are starting to become more important and are showing up on these live trees that are just under severe stress. The foliating insects such as the Douglas fir tussock moth or the Western spruce budworm or pine butterfly, these have really complicated relationships with climate and, and it's very difficult to just uniformly say they're going to respond like this or that depending on um, climate or weather uh, because it can be very complicated. We have seen some relationship with droughts preceding outbreaks, but this implies that the drought ends and you know foliage is put on by the tree and then you get these outbreaks. But this is still uh, something that is very complicated. We don't have any um, you know, sort of uniform ways to think about these with climate. The same thing with aphids, adelgids, and scales. It's also really complicated. These are insects with piercing sucking mouth parts that um, uh, feed on uh, leaves and foam of small twigs and such. 
Um, terminal and branch insects, uh, these are often associated with high stress because they can overcome the vigor of the trees and burrow into branches and tops and that kind of thing. These would be things like the Douglas fir uh, weevil. And then uh, things like pitch moths and other things that attack the bull often are associated with wounding. So this is just a quick review of these kind of groups. However, what I really want to emphasize is that there's winners and losers depending on what happens next with the climate. Um, so for example, we can think about this hotter, drier, more heat type um, environment, and there's probably going to be winners and losers. So for example, the winners we think of traditionally would be bark beetles, wood borers, things like pitch moths and terminal and branch insects, and possibly some of the root diseases and canker diseases. Uh, the losers might be things like foliage diseases and mistletoe. Mistletoe ex exacerbates uh, branch death and a lot, during drought, and a lot of times you'll get branch, the mistletoe branches will die during drought, and that kills the mistletoe. Um, we're not sure about some of these others. Uh, I didn't really want to speculate on defoliators and indulges because they're so complicated, but we do see, depending on what climate does and how climate change moves, we do expect winners and losers. So this is Mount Pyre from the Klamath country in about 2010. This, um, we uh, associated this with age classes of um, a uniform age class of lodgepole pine in this particular area, but also the sizes of lodgepole pine really set it up for a susceptible area, excuse me, susceptibility to bark beetles. This is some uh, type of mortality that has been emerging in Western Oregon, particularly along the I-5 corridor and in the Southern Oregon uh, with the flat-headed fir borer, buprested wood boring beetle that has been associated with Douglas fir mortality. In, um, and we see it, you know, in this particular photo, it's kind of a classic where you see these trees mixed in with oaks are dying, trees along edges are dying, trees along ridge tops are dying. And uh, you get scattered mortality, but not 100% complete mortality. And a lot of these trees will have the flat, most of these trees in this particular picture, we think have flat headed fir borer in them. And this again, we associate with stress that these flat headed fir borers would not go for really healthy trees. So these trees are probably under drought and heat stress. Another one pathogen that we think is may accentuate its impacts um, because it's known to build up in maladapted tree populations and trees under stress is armillaria root disease. This is a fungus. It's also known as a honey mushroom. And this, these are some of the mushrooms here and it attacks the roots. And um, you see this white mycelium under the roots here. And this is what's actually killing the uh, inner bark. And then it subsequently decays the wood. Uh, but this is a really important pathogen in the West, in, in particular in conifer forests. Um, however, we have seen areas in the West, not in Oregon necessarily, but we have seen in Oregon along the coast where there is some, you, we can see summer precipitation changes. So uh, particularly in British Columbia, for example, there's been an outbreak of a foliage disease called Dothostroma and lodgepole pine. And this has been associated with increases in summer precipitation. In, the, in Oregon, the Swiss needle cast foliage disease outbreak that has been epidemic along the Oregon coast since the mid 1990s is associated with the fog belt and increased um, precipitation and fog along the western slope of the coast range. And it's been fairly restricted to that zone, but that zone apparently is held pretty steady. And although the rest of the state is drying out, the um, coastal influence zone has remained fairly solid over the last uh, 25 years. But we do expect foliage diseases and rust diseases would be winners if, if we get start getting some summer precipitation. And this could just be Precipitation events that would last five days, for example, in June and July, could really change the situation for foliage diseases and rust fungi. Um, losers might be bark beetles because the trees are much more vigorous if we start getting more summer precipitation. 
And again, uh, things get complicated with some of these other groups. Um, this is uh, Swiss Neocast in Douglas Fir along the coast near Tillamook. Um, you can see this chlorotic looking foliage here. This is yellowish foliage. It's all Douglas fir on a southwest facing slope. And in between there are the hardwoods, the red alder, and then uh, Sitka spruce and western hemlock. And some are these green trees here. But the yellowish trees are all Douglas fir. And this is associated with um, mild winter temperatures, warmer winter temperatures, um, and uh, leaf wetness during May through August or July. Particularly July seems to be a real crux month if we get a lot of leaf wetness from precipitation or fog or some other factor, it can accentuate these diseases. So um, the other thing that um, interacts with a lot of these events is the pre-existing condition of the tree. And the, in, in particular, things like root diseases might, this is a Douglas fir here that had laminated root rot. The tree fell over uh, with a green crown, but uh, the roots ripped off as it went over and it obviously couldn't uh, sustain the weight of the upper crown. And uh, if a tree has one or two of its major roots compromised by root disease, when a drought comes along, it's definitely gonna be more stressed than a tree that has a healthy set of roots. So pre-existing conditions in trees often influence their response to things. And um, it's difficult to actually know what all the pre-existing conditions are in a tree. But in the case of this tree, you know, bark beetles were probably, uh, you know, followed the root disease. And a lot of times root disease trees get attacked by bark beetles in preference to other trees. Um, now, we've also started to experience some, in the last couple of years, some extreme events up here in Oregon. And the one, the one closest to home here uh, that just happened was the June 26th to 28th or 29th extreme heat event that we had. We're not really sure the full implications, but we've started to see this crown scorch. And this is a picture from the Toledo area over on Highway 20. And as you're driving from the Newport to Corvallis, for example, you really see these, uh, this scorch on these trees in this area. And these Douglas firs are, these are all mostly Douglas fir and they're heavily scorched on the south and southwest side of the tree crowns. So the trees that were exposed really, really took, took a hit. And the foliage apparently has been killed, but it tends to be only one-sided on these crowns. So we're not really sure the full implications of this. These kind of events combined with drought could lead to a delayed mortality. And we would anticipate wood borers and possibly Douglas fir beetle might be associated with the mortality if it does occur. However, we're not exactly sure what is gonna happen with this, whether these trees will recover or not. Um, and crown scorch basically has showed up in the coast range, particularly just inland of the, um, in like the Toledo area, which is about what, 10 miles from Newport was the peak area. And we think just inland from the coast, the coastal strip itself seemed to escape any of this uh, heat impact. The Willamette Valley, of course, we had really bad high temperatures in Portland and Salem in particular. And there's scorch of city trees was fairly common, particularly over parking lots and roads. And then in the um, foothills of the Cascades, we've also seen scorch um, where it looks like the current year foliage, the new foliage actually survived and the one, two and three year old foliage was killed. So it's been very complicated. However, this is one of the things that is sort of the wild card for us in the future is it looks like the footprint of extreme summer heat in the Northwest, uh, this is a NOAA uh, figure, is increasing um, and we don't even have the 2021 event on here. Um, and it was probably, you know, 90 to 100% of Oregon, Washington and Idaho were affected by this event. Um, so if this does continue uh, like we have extreme footprint um, or excuse me, extreme events like this into the future, um, becoming more common, then the interaction with insects is gonna, and diseases is gonna become particularly important, but 
we don't really understand completely how the diseases and, or excuse me, pathogens and insects are really going to interact. And I think this recent event is going to give us some insight into that over the next six months or so. Um, also, the other thing that we're dealing with is the potential of these crazy, you know, dry, hot, strong east wind events during the fire season like we had over the Labor Day in 2020 when we had all of these fires. This photo on the lower left here, you can see the fires were burning across Oregon and Northern California and the wind was blowing from the east so all the smoke uh, went out over the ocean. Of course that changed after the wind patterns changed and we got smoked in for a while but this kind of thing and the interaction with insects and diseases and fire is very complicated. Um, there's a lot of speculation that Douglas fir beetle may increase in abundance because of the propensity for a lot of trees to be wounded in ground fire and that kind of thing. And this may be exacerbated by some of the um, uh, snow, snow uh, event we had where a lot of trees came down in the snow. And we had an ice event, a lot of the trees came down in the ice. There's this thinking that the Douglas fir populations are high, although we don't have data for this. And there's a lot of speculation about it, but it's possible that these fires could exacerbate insect issues. Um, okay, so uh, management for all of this, for drought, insects and pathogens, end label is sort of this classic, it depends. And it depends on all of these caveats that we were discussing, landscape, um, you know, shape, you know, topography, elevation, aspect, um, cold air drainage, landscape features. Uh, this is a photo from the Oregon coast range of some of the industrial timberlands that we have. Very productive stands on uh, shorter rotations, usually around 40 to 50 years and, um, and typically dominated by Douglas fir. And so what the future management of these stands might be very different than for the higher elevation stands in the Cascades or for the uh, Ponderosa pine and a lodgepole pine forest on the east side. Um, the age, structure and composition of stands really influences what insects may be important or diseases, pathogens may be important. The stand history has a lot to do with this also. And so planting the right tree in the right place is always our mantra, but the confusion these days is what is the right tree and um, where should the seed source come from? And um, there's a lot of discussion about this. And I think uh, Glenn will be uh, discussing this in depth. Um, the managing for drought uh, and right tree in the right place, but you know, often we talk about density and uh, competition management uh, for, to maintain healthy stands. Um, inland, we would, you know, inland from the coast or wherever, we would really think that maybe we should be shifting to drought tolerant varieties and species. However, this is becoming um, much more complicated than we realized. And with the hotter drought, we're uncertain about our thinning protocols from the past applying to the future. And these thinning protocols are usually having trees evenly spaced, widely spaced, giving them room for water and um, other, you know, room to grow kind of things. But what we're concerned about now is how this might influence ground temperature, might influence crown exposure, and whether there is a silviculture for the future that may involve more complicated thinning regimes to try to um, you know, create more heterogeneity in canopy structure and not have even structured uh, widely spaced crowns that could be more susceptible to these extreme heat events. And this is all conjecture on my part right now, but um, there's a lot of, of you know, debate right now within the silviculture community about whether traditional thinning is the answer to the future drought and heat problems that we're um, facing. All right, so uh, some conclusions, uh, weather associated with 
age is very uncertain, but it appears we're basically heading into a hotter, drier uh, environment in the future, particularly if the last 20 years is any indicator. But as we know, things can change abruptly and, and we, it's very difficult to predict precipitation patterns in the future. We know it's gonna be hotter. Precip is the thing that's really the wild card. Um, drought impacts are gonna vary with the landscape setting and the changing climate. And this is gonna influence the pathogens and pests that are gonna interact with trees across the landscape. So you're not necessarily gonna see, you know, super, you know, one thing happening across the entire landscape at the same time. It may be more elevationally driven or um, geographically driven. Specifics in, in, and again, specific insects and pathogens were gonna vary with geographic location and tree species and landscape setting. Uh, the dominance of one age class and species can exacerbate particular issues. So it's really behooves us to consider uh, diversifying the landscape um, where we can and uh, not allowing um, single species to really, you know, of a certain age class to dominate large areas of the landscape. But again, this is easier said than done. And, um, but it is something to consider. All right. Um, I hope that was a sort of a, a short little insight into a topic which could go on for three weeks, but um, <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. That was great. Um, I think it's important to, uh, like what you pointed out, that there's a lot that science is still trying to figure out. There's a lot of variables and scientists are trying to keep up with the pace of how fast everything's changing. And there's just a lot to, to learn and keep up with. So uh, yeah, there's still a lot of unknowns and a lot of uncertainties. And I think uh, that was great to point that out. Um, let's see if, uh, if there's a question that came in from uh, the comment section. Do you have any thoughts on the historical pre-settlement vegetation maps that show more oak savanna and less Douglas fir forests below 1500 feet in elevation in the Willamette Valley? Yeah, that's a really significant thing. I don't think people tend to realize that the Willamette Valley was basically fire adapted communities. Um, oak and some conifer existed. You know, there was more, there was Ponder Willamette Valley, Ponderosa Pine was also around. Um, and I think that's very significant over the, the since um, fire suppression, Douglas fir has really moved into a lot of the oak forest region and um, due to just the luck of sort of where the rainfall was in the in the period you know in some of the periods there particularly in the 70s and 80s and uh, so yeah the those firs really moved in in some areas so now we're we're seeing this same Douglas fir that moved into these areas that were dominated by oak woodlands is where we're seeing a lot of this mortality um, it gets pretty complicated from there um, because, you know, we, we aren't really certain how much Douglas fir was on the landscape prior to the, um, to fire suppression, but we do believe that, you know, fire suppression definitely allowed a major increase in uh, Douglas fir. So, you know, much of the mortality we're seeing in Southern Oregon and, and um, Willamette Valley in Douglas fir in the Oak zone is associated with trees that are in that age class of, you know, 70 to 120 years old. And uh, particularly down in that mixed conifer area of Southern um, Oregon, where Douglas fir is really taking a hit below a certain elevation. And it is associated with this with this previous expansion and now a contraction associated with drought. And the role fire would might play in all of that is really complicated. We assume that the, you know, particularly in the lower elevation oak stands that fire return interval was, you know, less than 20 years or maybe even less than that. And, um, and now of course, fire suppression has really prevented any fires. So uh, I, I don't want to belabor this point too much, but yeah, I think it's very significant. And I think it has a lot to say about some of these mortality, um, ge geographical mortality patterns that we're seeing with Douglas fir. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, hopefully I answered that all right. I started meandering there a little bit, but. No, that was great. <laughs> yeah, thanks to whoever asked that question. Um, you, you mentioned it a moment ago and you also had on your slides about uh, mortality or susceptibility to pathogens and insects. It can be uh, correlated with age a lot of times and that younger trees tend to be more susceptible well, oftentimes. Could you explain for folks what causes that? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's um, there's various insects and disease which would you would find more prevalent in young stands versus older stands. So in terms of insects, for example, we tend to get more aphids and adelgids and those kind of things in young stands. And they, they might dominate the canopies, whereas in older stands, you'll get a much more complicated uh, insect community. Um, in, you know, root diseases in young stands um, that might be persisting on stumps that then spread into these even structured stands, they often spread uh, best in, in these younger to uh, moderate age stands, which are, you know, even um, the, a single species stand with lots of root contacts and grafts. Whereas when you get into an older, old growth stand, there's still root disease for sure but it doesn't necessarily spread as easily as it does because there's more species diversity in the below ground, uh, root to root contacts and that kind of things. And Western red cedar might block the spread of a disease from Douglas fir to a Douglas fir. Uh, whereas in younger stands, they can spread tree to tree. So, um, and some of these root diseases uh, and foliage diseases we've also seen, they tend to be um, exacerbated in younger stands just because it seems like the, the uniformity of the canopy provides much more uniform. So we see more of a uniform distribution of disease in these younger stands than we do in older stands. It's not to say the same fungi aren't present in the older stands. They just might not be causing the same amount of damage because it's not as a uh, um, homogeneous type of environment for the fungus. So um, these younger stands, then you can get a buildup of some of the um, diseases, but um, in older stands, they're known to be, you know, in the, the old term, they used to call them decadent because they had a lot of heart rot and wood decay and gappiness in them. And that's true. In younger stands, heart rot has essentially been eliminated from the plantations management. You know, heart rot's a non-issue for industry in the West Side but yet it in stands over 120 to, you know, 400 years old, you know, heart rot might be really common in those stands, but there it ends up being really important in habitat. Um, live trees with wood decays are particularly important for wildlife. Um, so, you know, there's all these complications uh, in terms of what you might find more abundant in an old growth stand versus um, what you might find in younger stands. And um, I think it, a dominance of any one age class over, or any one species over, you know, any one species, which in, in a similar age class is really what we're trying to avoid. I think it just is, um, you know, in terms of forest management, uh, I would recommend that, I guess. I don't know if I answered that as eloquently as I was. No, that's great. To, yeah. But... Yeah. Thanks for explaining <laughs> that. Cause I, I asked you that the other day when we were talking and I was thinking at first, oh, that seems a little counterintuitive. And then when you explained it, it makes a lot of sense. So I think that was helpful information. Clinton, did you have a question? Yeah, and I'm going to show my uh, lack of knowledge in this area. But I was curious if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how permacultural ideas, um, mutualisms between species um, might be a part of ongoing and future forest management to, be, to have more pest resistant stands. You spoke to it a little bit just now in terms of age class. Then sort of on the other side, um, you know, how, what are we learning from some of the genetically modified uh, nursery stock, learning from row crop uh, to make pest resistant uh, nursery stock? Are these things, I'm assuming these are things, but I just don't know much about them. How are these things being thought about in context of climate change? Yeah, so that's a million dollar question, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think we, we um, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, the, the, the landscape is dominated, forest management is dominated by native species. 
And so, you know, we have Douglas fir, Western Hemlock, Grand fir, Six Spruce on the east side, Ponderosa Pine, Western Larch are the top, you know, species that people grow. These, because they're native trees and typically in their native region, the benefits of mycorrhizae and various other symbionts and those kind of things are, are real. And I think there's sort of something that we just take for granted. And um, it's something that I think is really important. And so I think our forestry stands are actually, you know, more resilient because of these native, you know, symbioses that we know occur. Um, when we begin to consider shifting to either, you know, non-native species or eucalyptus or something like that, then you begin to, you know, approach agriculture a lot more. And where the, in those kind of cases, you know, manipulating and um, mycorrhizae and various other kinds of symbionts for those trees might make sense. But in the Northwest, we're sort of blessed with it, just seems to happen because, you know, the stands are surrounded by other Douglas fir with mycorrhizae and the sport dispersal and other things are happening. So if we've kind of, we're kind of blessed in the Northwest with, um, the benefits of these kind of things being normal. And I think as, you know, depending on what happens in the future and what, what people decide to plant, that's really important. Um, and as far as the GMO thing goes, um, it's not really a topic in the Pacific Northwest in forestry that I'm aware of. I think there's a few people talking about it, but it's thought that the public reaction to GMO trees would be so negative that nobody even wants to talk about it. The everything that we've done um, with is through Ben, I think all the tree improvement that has been done is through traditional tree breeding. And uh, Glenn can definitely talk more about this than, than I can. But um, that's my impression is that all the, you know, we're in the third generation uh, improved um, Douglas fir stock already, you know, and so there's been um, the, the, the sort of, you know, we, we're sort of so lucky, I guess, with, you know, our native, using our native species on native lands that, you know, we, we've benefited by these kind of symbiosis and, you know, as we move forward and people begin to talk about other tree crops, I think then things will get, you know, more, into the realm of agriculture and actually having to manipulate things a little more to, um, you know, have a success. Um, uh, but, you know, I think plant adaptation and climate change is gonna force a lot of rethinking of, you know, a lot of what I said probably. Um, but, um, you know, it's really hard to predict the future, but I'm hopeful that our native species can kind of hold their own and we're not gonna have to, you know, you know, replace all of the Oregon vegetation with some other vegetation. I just don't see, you know, how, I mean, I think that's a worst case scenario, obviously, and we don't know where a hundred years is going to bring us, but I'm hoping we can stop the carbon dioxide at some point. <laughs> anyway, Thank sorry you about much. that. No, I appreciate you tackling it. Thank you. Uh, Dave, last question I have for you is um, for a timber or small woodland owner out there that might be wondering if their trees are afflicted with something or they're trying to identify what the problem is, what would you recommend as far as resources on where they could go to help them figure out what might be causing their trees to be sick? Yeah, depending on um, you know their situation, their landowner, whether they're considering a timber sale or something like that, there's um, various, the OSU extension of course is our forestry extension, forestry and natural resources extension is a go-to group and our county agents. They tend to be a little spread thin though and they can't respond to everybody personally, but they can try. We do have volunteers that can then help um, a master, uh, you know, this is called the master woodland managers and they actually help the extension agents a lot. Um, there's Oregon Department of Forestry also, they have a really good forest health group uh, based in Salem. There's four people in that group, I believe. And they um, uh, they also have their stewardship foresters and the stewardship foresters are very knowledgeable. Many of them can help diagnose issues in the field. And particularly if you're, you know, looking at a forest management plant, 
Um, both Stewardship Foresters and uh, Forestry Extension can help with that. Um, there's also a format called Ex Ask an Expert, and uh, that's a web-based thing that um, you can go through through Extension, and it's always really helpful to uh, include photographs when you ask a, do an Ask an Expert question. If you do have a specific problem, you're looking for an answer. Particularly if you can get like a context photo that shows the situation the tree's in with a little bit of the landscape around it. And then the particular, the particular close up of what's the problem with the tree. Oftentimes we can uh, diagnose things through ask an expert and uh, that people can get answers through that. So that's a few ideas. Um, I think in Oregon, we're actually pretty blessed. If you're a federal uh, forest Service with the Forest Service or with BLM or with the tribes or the National Park Service, the, they have a, a group called Forest Health Protection and they have uh, forest entomologists, forest pathologists, and ecologists spread through the region. And you can uh, go to those group, the, go to that group for answers. And there's the uh, Forest Health Protection has a great website. OSU has good websites too for, there's a lot of information online about insects and diseases, but sometimes it can be really difficult to navigate. Uh, there are some field guides that, um, there's a new field guide coming out for insects and diseases pretty soon for Oregon and Washington, conifers that is. And um, so, yeah, there are a lot of resources yeah. out there. Great, yeah, that, that helps a lot. I think that'll uh, be a lot of good resources for folks and uh, we can share some of those on our website so people can link directly to them. Yeah, thanks right. so much, Dave. Um, okay. Yeah, so next here, um, we're excited to welcome Glenn Howe. Glenn is an associate professor at OSU and the director of the Pacific Northwest Tree Improvement Research Cooperative. And his research focuses on the breeding, ecological, genetics, and genomics of forests. And that includes growing our understanding of climate-associated patterns of genetic variation, physiological adaptation to climate, and assisted migration. Welcome, Glenn, and thanks for being here. Okay, um, I'll see if I can um, get things going here in terms of sharing my presentation. Bear with me here, here we go. Okay, how are we looking there? Looks good, we can see it. Okay, well good, so can I. So we're in, in, good, uh, in good shape here. So thanks for that introduc introduction and, and thanks um, obviously for the um, uh, opportunity to speak today. And I will do get my laser pointer going. Okay, so I think I'm all set. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, um, primarily talk about some conceptual uh, concepts related to natural and assisted migration of forest trees and then focus on some tools that we're trying to develop so that people can apply some of the concepts I'll talk about um, uh, in operational forestry. So in this talk, I'll first address natural and assisted migration of forest trees. Then I'll focus on um, assisted migration at the species level and a tool we developed called the uh, species potential habitat tool. And then later on, I'll focus on within species or what we call population level assisted migration and two related tools uh, called the seed lot selection tool and the zone matcher uh, tool that uh, people uh, might be uh, interested in checking out and perhaps applying in, in terms of managing forests. So um, as we know, climate change is expected to alter tree reproduction, survival and growth, increase disturbances from fire, insects, pathogens, and and also change species habitats, uh, distributions and overall forest composition. And so I'm gonna focus on uh, changing species uh, habitats and, and potentially distributions. And these are particularly interesting um, because these changes um, may be informative because of how they integrate some of these other potential effects. And so that's um, kind of a broader implication of some of the changes in habitats and distributions. So I'm going to start out uh, talking about some concepts related to habitat and, and how that plays into some of the tools we developed. Uh, the middle figures um, here show two contrasting 
species um, uh, distributions, uh, Western hemlock and um, Rocky Mountain juniper in British Columbia. And then these occupy different locations primarily because these species are adapted to different habitats. And so these lower, these two lower diagrams, these gridded diagrams on the bottom kind of demonstrate that. Uh, the lower diagrams show representations of each species habitat along two environmental axes. Soil nutrient regime is listed across the top, um, ranging from very poor to very rich soils. And then soil moisture regime is listed along the left of each of these um, diagrams here, ranging from very dry to wet. And so from these two diagrams, you can see that these two species occupy very different habitats. And uh, one of the things in terms of how people deal with these concepts is that these habitats are often described this way, graphically with different axes representing different habitat factors. And then so sometimes people use the terms uh, or describe this as uh, these are the habitat spaces of these species. And then when we talk about climate change and climate variables in particular, we often uh, refer to the climate spaces of these species. And so a lot of the, um, the things I talk about are, are related or are foundational on this concept of climate space of a species and how that's related to their habitat. So climate uh, is important, but then I wanna um, emphasize, and this is to, to give a little um, shout out to Dave's presentation there, that climate is important, but so are other aspects of the environment in which um, species occupy. And this would be the abiotic environment and the um, biotic environment. And so um, this figure emphasizes that the full range of factors that influence the species habitat, including the, the biotic factors on the left and the abiotic factors on the right. But then what happens when the climate changes? And the, the first thing we see is that uh, climate change will uh, directly alter the important climatic determinants of a species habitat, including, for example, here shown here, temperature and moisture. And then these will um, go ahead and affect the other um, aspects of the environment, the biotic aspects of the environment, such as the animals, plants, fungi, and microorganisms that also influence where um, species can survive, grow, and reproduce. And so, um, these indirect effects then have some uh, effect on where su suitable habitat will exist in the future. And this is important because although I'll, I'll focus on climate variables and climate space in, in the future um, parts of this uh, presentation, we also realize we must not ignore these other factors and that when you know, decisions are made in terms of uh, reforestation decisions in terms of choice of species and perhaps seed source, these other kind of factors need to be considered um, and in combination with um, expert knowledge to make wise reforestation decisions. So in considering how to make these wise reforestation decisions, we need to know how species habitats will change in the future. And so this slide shows um, projected habitat change in white spruce, and again, in British Columbia uh, from uh, existing habitat uh, a few years ago until the habitat is that is projected to be uh, available in British Columbia in the 2080s. So this shows the potential changes in habitat of white spruce. And so these kinds of changes in habitat need to be considered in terms of managing the species and in particular during reforestation. And so this uh, slide here uh, shows an analysis that um, asks the question, will plants and will species be able to migrate fast enough to track changes in climate. And so this analysis shows the speed of climate change for areas of the globe inhabited by various biomes. And the small table here on the right that I made um, shows the needed speed of migration focusing on three forest biomes. And so these changes in climate then um, are estimated to be about 110 meters per year for temperate conifers, um, ranging up to about 430 meters per year for boreal and tega, um, the, the boreal and tega biome. And then the temperate and broadleaf uh, mixed forest, for example, will need to migrate in, in an estimated way of 350 meters per year 
but according to this paper here, um, in which this uh, analysis was done, they um, stated that this level of needed migration of climate exceeds the fastest model rates of tree migration, but may fall within the ranges empirically observed during the last glaciation. So raises the question again, are trees um, gonna be able to migrate fast enough to keep pace with changes in climate? And this is another paper that summarized similar studies across a large number of tree species. And what this study did in terms of um, analyzing a lot of different studies themselves, they found that a high percentage of uh, species show evidence of recent migration, presumably due to recent climate change representing um, ranging from about 23 to 84% of the species showed some evidence of recent migration. And then furthermore, the proportion of species that seem to be migrating uh, fast enough to keep pace with climate change was not very high. So no more than about 22% then of the species that are that were where they had definitive data um, seem to be migrating fast enough to keep play, keeping pace with the change of climate. So again, these last two slides are, are designed to emphasize the real concerns about uh, tree species ability to migrate fast enough to keep pace with uh, the current or a projected rate of climate change. So how do we, I just wanna to touch briefly on how we project uh, where species can occur in the future, because this gives people an idea about the limitations and uses of these kinds of data. Um, so how do we project species where species can occur in the future? And these models come with various names, uh, but I tend to use the term habitat model because typically uh, foresters have a good basic or, or pre-existing knowledge of what we mean by habitat. But generally, um, this slide here shows a graphical representation of a typical approach used for um, species habitat modeling. And so the upper left figure shows the sample locations that are used to understand where a, current, a species currently exists. And then this panel here um, represents the various climate and other kinds of environmental variables that are believed to be important drivers of the distribution of the species. And then by taking these existing current um, sources of information, one can develop a mathematical model that can be used to predict where these species, um, where the species occurs based on these environmental envi variables, including climate. And so these two pieces of information are combined to develop the mathematical model. And then that can be used to predict where the species is located on the ground so that species distribution can be inferred without actually measuring the species in the field. And when you can do that, then you can replace these existing uh, climate and other environmental variables with projected climate of the future and come up with projected areas where habitat will occur in the future. And that is shown by this bottom figure here. And in this case, the, um, the light gray indicates unsuitable habitat for this particular species. And then the dark gray indicates suitable habitat. So the development of these kind of models is kind of critical for trying to infer um, in many cases where species habitats are likely to occur in the future. Now, the important thing we have to realize is that because the habitat exists there, that doesn't necessarily mean that the species will exist there. It may be that they cannot migrate there or there may be other non-climatic factors that prevent them from occupying those areas. So again, we always need to remember that we're projecting uh, potential habitat and not actual species distributions. So then how can forest managers respond to this kind of information? First, you'd wanna choose appropriate species um, in terms of uh, favoring uh, during management operations or during reforestation. And then particularly if you're practicing artificial regeneration, you wanna make sure you're choosing appropriate seed lots for the particular site that you're dealing with. So first step, choose appropriate species. And here's an example of um, some model species distributions. This is a model Douglas fir distribution at ex as it existed uh, a few years ago in 2012. And then at that time they projected that this would be the um, habitat of Douglas fir in about the 2030s. 
And so in these kinds of figures and these red areas here showed, show areas where habitat is expected to be lost um, within this future time period. And the green areas show areas where that habitat is expected to be retained. And so this kind of information can be valuable then um, for species uh, making reforestation decisions. And in particular, in these red areas, um, one may want to think about carefully about whether um, new plantations of Douglas fir should be established in those areas. And so this can be very helpful as long as you have um, uh, information of this nature at a sufficient resolution to be more or less uh, helpful in site-specific forest management. Then if, if you've chosen a particular species to either favor or use in reforestation or um, use in art artificial regeneration, let's say, you want to make sure that you choose appropriate seed sources. And this is because not all populations or seed sources of a species are alike. One must also consider the seed source when, when one makes these reforestation decisions. And so this slide shows three provenance or seed source tests, seed source tests. And the picture on the right shows a lodgepole pine seed source test growing in New Zealand. And so what we mean by a seed source test is that seeds were collected from native lodgepole pine populations in Western North America and then uh, grown and uh, followed in New Zealand. And so each of these square plots represents then a single seed source from the native range of lodgepole pine. And so you can clearly see huge differences in survival and growth among these different um, lodgepole pine provenances or seed sources. And then on the left, we see similarly large differences uh, among Douglas fir provenances growing in Spain. So one needs to choose an appropriate seed source uh, and one cannot treat species as if they're homogeneous. So um, a lot of the people who deal with these issues, uh, including myself, believe that assisted migration is, will be a very important tool for, for helping forests adapt to climate change. And so very broadly speaking, assisted migration is the intentional movement of species, populations, or genotypes outside of the known historical distributions in response to anticipated climate change. But given that broad definition, we can also think about different types of assisted migration. And this slide emphasizes those. At the species level, um, we can practice long distance translocation of species. So for example, the use of exotic species. And this has you know, biological implications that are very different from what is sometimes called species range expansion. This would be the kind of uh, assisted migration that one would practice, for example, with a native tree species. And then finally, the implications of each of those are different from the kind of consequences um, of practicing what we call population level, um, population level system migration, or what is more commonly referred to as seed transfer. And in the Pacific Northwest, then um, either species level system migration almost invariably refers to assisted range expansion rather than exotic species translocation. Um, and then we, we often uh, practice a lot of seed transfer within the normal course of forestry operations. So first I'll focus on species level system migration and a tool that we developed to help provide people with some of this needed information called the species potential habitat tool. Um, we developed a species habitat tool to deliver species level information to forest managers. Uh, here's the, um, the web address of that. Uh, you can also find it simply by Google, Googling species potential habitat tool. And it is a web-based mapping tool to help forest managers match species with planting sites based on climate information. And it is based on um, model species distributions using approaches such as those I described above by Tong Li Wang at the University of British Columbia. So users of the tool first select one of these uh, seven species. These are the ones we currently have species distributions available in this tool. And then they would choose a time frame and one or more future climate scenarios, for example, um, in terms of practicing assisted migration uh, to help force adapt to climate change. So this, uh, in this case, the user had selected Sitka spruce. And so what this figure then shows is the projected future distribution of Cisco spruce in 2085. 
um, using the so-called business as usual climate change scenario, also sometimes called RCP 8.5. And the key things here is that these yellow areas show locations where Sika spruce is expected, Sika spruce habitat is expected to be lost. So the Sika spruce may still be there, but they may not be doing very well. Um, and then uh, in contrast, these blue areas represent areas where based on these models, uh, Sika spruce habitat is expected to be gained in the future. So now I just wanna um, look at a couple other examples, uh, focusing on some uh, distinctions between Ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. These are two species that occupy different habitats. Again, shown here in that um, soils, uh, soils um, environmental space that I talked about earlier in this case, uh, the orange represents ponderosa pine along a nutrient regime and soil moisture regime uh, mapped here and Douglas fir represented by blue. And similarly, um, these two species occupy slightly different uh, climate spaces as well. So in the next few slides, uh, using this tool, I'll show some of the projected changes in the um, habitat for Douglas fir and ponderosa pine. So we'll look at Douglas fir first. And this figure shows the baseline distribution of Douglas fir. So this distribution is the one that was generated using the so-called species distribution model using those um, procedures I talked about earlier. And in the next few slides, you know, you want to look at what's happening overall to the habitat of Douglas fir um, in terms of the various colors. And then also I'm going to focus a little bit, um, particularly at the end, on what's happening in south southwest Oregon here. So first, um, onto the baseline distribution, we can overlay the suitable habitat um, for Douglas fir in 2025 uh, using two future climate scenarios. And what we see is changes throughout the uh, range of Douglas fir. And then in, um, in Southwest Oregon, we see much green remains in the area of South Central Oregon with some yellow appearing around Medford, indicating that Douglas fir in Oregon um, indicating in these areas that Douglas fir habitat is expected to be lost in this um, subregion of the Douglas fir range. If we look further into the future, 2055, we see uh, additional increases in ye yellow in this general area um, and be some yellow, these yellow areas indicating loss of habitat occurring slightly farther north. And then if we look even farther out, you see the kind of progression of this yellow, uh, yellowing particularly in Southwest Oregon indicating loss of um, Douglas fir habitat. Again, Douglas fir may not disappear uh, right away from these areas, but these would be areas where they would, Douglas fir would not be expected to do as well as it would um, had that habitat remained completely suitable for um, that species. Next, we can look at ponderosa pine, uh, focusing on the overall species distribution again, and then we'll also kind of focus on what's happening here. Now, the only caveat here is that um, in this case, we're, we're looking at ponderosa pine variety ponderosa um, because that's what we have in terms of species um, model information. And in 2025, we see much green, um, we can see what's happening broadly across the range. And then we can see much green remains again in the Southwest Oregon area um, with some areas of blue appearing a little farther north indicating potential gains in ponderosa habitat in these areas. Again, if we look farther out, we see additional blue appearing in this area. Um, and some, uh, again, some areas of green, green remaining um, in these areas indicating retention of ponderosa pine habitat. And in 2085, again, we see some more yellow, but then also some uh, general increases in blue indicating potential gains in ponderosa pine habitat in this area. So if we kind of compare now Douglas fir to, um, uh, compare Douglas fir to ponderosa pine, uh, Douglas fir on the top, ponderosa pine on the bottom, zooming in on one of these areas, here's a clear area where we're expecting to see losses of Douglas fir habitat indicated by the yellow, yet for ponderosa pine, we see either remaining uh, habitat or perhaps some increases, uh, gains in habitat for ponderosa pine. So these are the kind of areas where you might expect to, uh, that foresters might want to seriously consi consider transitioning from establishing Douglas fir plantations, if they are in this area, to establishing species such as ponderosa pine, maybe other uh, another variety of ponderosa pine, 
or perhaps other species that would also um, be perhaps even more suitable for these particular habitats. So those, that's the kind of information and tools that can be used to help you make uh, suitable species uh, choices. Um, but then we also, again, need to consider what's happening within species because all populations of a species are not alike. And so we previously developed what is called the CLAT selection tool to help with these kinds of questions. So first, um, just to talk a little bit about how within species um, population variation is handled currently. This upper figure, uh, upper left figure simply highlights the fact that Pacific Northwest has lots of environmental variability. The center figure shows the various seed zones that have been used to manage the environmental variability and the population level genetic variability within species. And so a seed zone then is a geographic area or climatic area within which populations um, are considered to be gen genetically homogeneous, consists of a geographic area and typically an elevational band. Um, and so operationally, this means that if one collects seed from one of these particular seed zones, the resulting trees are expected to perform well as long, they, as, long as they are planted within the same seed zone. And that is movement of reforestation materials within seed zone is allowed, but movement from one seed zone to another using these, these traditional management uh, approaches is not allowed because the pop resulting plantations are not expected to perform well. And then here we have two um, publications that are commonly uh, used and commonly used by foresters that contain all the seed zones for the major tree species in Oregon and Washington. So seed zones have been widespread, have been in widespread use since the 1960s, but what if the climate changes? Then these seed zones will no longer uh, be valid in terms of the, the, their intent at managing or matching the populations within the species to the climate of the planting site. And so this will cause a, um, a mismatch between the populations of trees and the climate of their planting sites that needs to be accounted for um, in terms of uh, climate change and the way that, it, that it's typically thought of is using within population assisted migration. So again, uh, we developed a seed lot selection tool to help with these kinds of questions. Um, the seed lot selection tool, again, is a climate mapping tool, uh, a web-based climate mapping tool that allows foresters to match seed lots with planting sites. The climates that can be used include past climate to which a seed lot is presumed to be adapted. It also includes current climate of planting sites and possible future climates of planting sites if you want to match um, current seed lots to future planting sites to, to optimize adaptation at some point in the future. So in using this tool, one first needs to indicate whether is one, one is looking for seed lots to use at a particular planting site. Or conversely, uh, perhaps if you're a seed orchard manager, you might have a seed lot and you're trying to uh, find out where that seed lot might be planted. So we have two kind of um, uh, sides of the same coin that one might be using this tool for. And so after one decides uh, what uh, approach is to be used, and in this case, I have an example of someone trying to find a seed lot for a, a particular planting site. One selects a planting site location indicated by this blue pin in this area here. And then uh, one chooses the climate variables to consider. And so in this example, I used mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation. And then one can either use current climate information or future climate projections. And so what this figure then shows is the areas of um, matching climates to this plantation site. So these would represent the potential areas where one would go to to collect seed for establishing on this planting site. And in these uh, colored areas, the orange represents a better climatic match to this planting site. And the lighter uh, orange or yellow represents um, uh, a less um, good uh, match to this particular planting site. And so this is where someone would go currently. So this kind of climate-based approach could be used instead of the traditional geographically based seed zones. And then in addition, if we look at um, where we might go um, to find seed lots that are adapted, adapted to this planting site in the future, for example, in 2025, 
we see in general that we would tend to go to areas that are lower elevation, closer to the coast, perhaps a little bit farther south, that is slightly warmer and drier areas tend to be matches in the future for a particular planting site today. And then again, if I look at future climates, you'll see that that same trend continues. We see lower elevation areas closer to the coast, farther south being good matches for this particular planting site in 2055. And then if we even look at out to 2085 using these particular climate um, scenarios, we see only one little spot here, which is a very good climate match for this particular planting site in the future, based on the particular set of assumptions used in this analysis. And then if I zoom in a little bit more, I can see some other areas a little bit farther south from those figures I showed you earlier. So in summary, the, the Sea Life Selection Tool is a web-based tool that shows the locations of climate matches. Um, but the, the one thing about this, it's very good visual tool. Um, you can see what's going on. It is really not specifically designed to find named seed lots uh, for your planting site. So we um, more very recently developed another tool, a companion tool you might think of called the Zone Matcher. Uh, this was developed, um, the Zone Matcher, well, is a web application that facilitates a large scale operational seed deployment based on widely used existing seed deployment systems. So what this does is that it matches um, different seed zones or seed deployment zones that are used widely throughout the Pacific Northwest and find climate matches between those zones rather than um, specific geographic locations as shown in the seed lot selection tool. And the development of the zone matcher um, was mostly done by Meredith McClure as part of her master's thesis at Oregon State University. So really briefly, I'm not gonna go into this in much detail in the question of time, but what you can do then is, is rather than entering a particular location on a map, you can enter a named uh, seed zone into this tool. And that's shown up here, this is called the focal zone. And if you enter a named um, seed zone, and you provide, um, you wanna find matches either currently or in, under some future climate, this tool will, will present a large list of other seed zones or deployment zones throughout the Northwest that have a matching climate. And so you could then use this list here to see if you could find named seed lots that you might establish or use on this particular site. Um, one thing about the zone matcher is that it queries um, various seed zone systems used in California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and British Columbia. So all of those different kind of seed zone systems are integrated in this particular tool. Then let's suppose you find a particular seed lot is available, maybe as seed or maybe as seedlings. Uh, someone is selling seed from this particular seed lot here that is a reasonable match. You can then use another part of the tool to examine closely the climatic differences between the focal zone, the one you're perhaps interested in establishing a planting site in, and the seed lot um, that you found seedlings that someone is willing to sell to you. And you can look specifically at how those two, um, uh, how those two zones match up um, for a range of climate variables, perhaps. So for example, between current climate and maybe some future climate that you're trying to um, match um, to attain optimal performance in the future. Uh, so then both the Species Potential Habitat Tool and the CLAT Selection Tool were developed as a collaboration between the U.S. Forest Service, Oregon State University, and the Conservation Biology Institute. And then the Zone Matcher was developed at OSU by my graduate student, Meredith McClure, um, with these other folks providing assistance. And that was, uh, this particular one was funded by the Pacific Northwest Tree Improvement Research Cooperative and a grant from Northwest Climate um, Adaptation Science Center. So I'll be happy to take any questions that people might have um, on any of those topics. Thanks, Glenn. Really appreciate you sharing those tools and resources. Those look like really great sites for folks to check out when they're making determinations about which species they want to plant and trying to think ahead to the future. And uh, as someone who geeks out on range and distribution maps, I can guarantee you I'll be checking that out. Okay, well, good. Um, one thing that I was curious about is, um, 
you know, you think about certain subspecies like Willamette Valley Ponderosa pine, which has adaptations to wetter side forests than say the Ponderosa pine on the east side. And then you have the shore pine, which is a subspecies at Lodgepole. How common is that among merchantable tree species? And are we, does science think that that kind of spin-off of subspecies might be something that happens as the climate change a little more? Uh, okay, so I might take the answer to that in a slightly different direction. So yeah, so you, you would typically not think of those as being highly desirable um, from a commercial standpoint. What that means also is that um, you're not gonna find improved materials for a lot of those kind of species. Um, as I mentioned, I kind of alluded to in my talk, it means that you're also not gonna find necessarily good species distribution information for those species. Those are things that people would tend to uh, and are working on uh, secondarily. Um, but I think that information is very important, uh, important because we need to think beyond about the commercial applications. And I'm just kind of put that aside for a moment. And, you know, based on the information we have about changing habitats, it's not just the commercial species that need to be, um, that we need to pay attention to in, ter in terms of system migration. So if we want to maintain functioning forest ecosystems in a lot of these areas, we need to be thinking about um, doing this kind of thing for a full range of commercial and non-commercial species, in my mind. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, it, another stat you mentioned that was kind of stark was only, uh, it, it seems like only 22%, I think you showed, was the stat of uh, trees they thought might be able to keep up with the speed of uh, climate change using the models. Right. Um, were there any tree species native to our region that seem to fall within that 22% or do we know yet? Yeah, um, I don't think we, this is really hard to um, estimate. So um, I, I tend not to think about, I mean, there has been some of that work done, but even by some people at OSU looking for evidence in FIA data about species migrations for a range of species. Um, I tend to I tend to be more of a, a lumper than a splitter, so I, I tend to look at that information as, in general, what do we expect? I think it's very difficult to tie those kind of responses to particular species. It's very difficult to estimate um, uh, migration speeds. Number one, you know, one one empirical way is to use FIA data, but you know the, the amount of climate change has been pretty modest up until recently, and so looking back empirically does not give us a real good indication of how fast things can go. We can look over, use other kinds of approaches to try to infer species migration, but um, typically think about, people think about species migrating in a wave, but they don't necessarily, they often migrate from various refugia. And so it's just, it's really fraught with um, challenges in making those estimates. So I tend to look at it as what do we think in general? And I think there's you know, increasing evidence that in general, many species are gonna have problems keeping pace with climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Clinton, were there any questions on YouTube or any that you wanted to ask? Well, I had a, a bonus one that came up for me, but I actually, I think Glenn may have just hinted at it or, or answered it. I was curious about uh, research into the migration of particular or projecting particular understory associations, classes and series. You know, are those understory associated species moving linearly with the, um, with the tree species or is that complicated? Do we know? Um, so thinking, for example, uh, Grand Fur, Queen Cup Bee Lily Association, if the Grand Fur moves, can we assume that the Bee Lily is going to move linearly with it, or is it more complicated than that? Yeah, okay. So um, it's, yeah, it's always more complicated than that. Um, so a couple things. One, you know, it's really hard to... Um, to understand the changes in, you know, multi-species composition, um, you know, we might be talking about, you know, um, habitat types or, or you know, um, uh, you know, up in BC, they might be called, you know, ecoregions or, you know, whatever term you use, it's, it's hard to do that as well. So um, I tend to focus more on the individual species relationships first, because I think it's a little bit easier to do that. Um, uh, let's see, the other part you 
Let's say, what else did you, what was your, I think you had two parts to that question. Oh, I think I was just clarifying in the second part, but I was just curious about the research. And as you said, I mean, I know that there's research often driven by the merchantable species, but yeah, yeah. Um, understanding the um, relationship with understory. And so it was all kind of one question. And Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. We, 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 you know, even for these ma major tree species, you know, we don't know nearly as much as we would like. And so, um, I attempted to do that a little bit at the beginning, bringing in some of these other habitat factors. But you know, even these projections, such as those that we're presenting and people are coming up with, you know, they have they have wide wide error bars on them, and, and you need to um, take that into account. And this is even for you know the 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 uh, major tree species that have been studied. You know, let's say from genetic um, genetic standpoint, breeding standpoint, that have been studied for 50 or more years. We still don't even know enough about those to be super confident in what's going to happen. And so the, the, the challenges in doing understory speed, it just, it's just really fraught with, with, uh, <laughs> with a whole bunch of hard stuff. I mean, I think the idea is that, um, you know, the sea lot selection tool is based on um, migrations of climate. You know, I think we, we have a, a fairly, we're, well, even that we're, we're gaining a better understanding about how climates might change across the landscape. Um, but it's a whole nother story then to understand how all the different species will act, interact with those climates individually. And then once you put them all together in some kind of association, how they're going to interact. Um, yeah. Understood. Well, and, and for what it's worth, while you were going through the species potential habitat tool, I was playing with it. And I mean, it's an incredibly uh, illuminating tool and um, I'm excited to dig into it further. So I'm really grateful. For I think at least it demonstrates I think at, at a minimum, both those tools demonstrates you need to be paying close attention to this um, and, and doing something. Um, you know, um, I had a, some other slides I gave in other talks. You know, you have a your target, you know, um, you know, you're an archer and you have a target you're shooting for. Well, you know, the target being current climate is absolutely wrong. You know, we have a lot of uncertainty about where we're aiming that arrow in terms of future climates, but we know that most of those are going to be closer to the reality than than aiming at the current climate. Cool. Thank you for that. That's illuminating. Yeah, yeah we'll definitely share those resources on our, our website. We have a, a resources page um, for okay. a couple different uh, habitat types, and uh, we'll put those up there and make sure folks are able to get those. Uh, so thank you, Glenn. Thank you to Dave. Really appreciate your time today and for making uh, this very uh, elucidating and knowledgeable presentation for folks. Um, this presentation will be up in perpetuity on our website and our YouTube channel. That's uh, youtube.com slash longtomwsc. And also another reminder for folks, if you haven't checked out the video interview with Lindsay Reeves and Tom Bowman of Bowman Tree Farm. Uh, there's a lot of great material that relates directly with on the ground examples of some things that both Glenn and Dave have been talking about. And then uh, Lauren Grand from OSU Extension here in Eugene, uh, she provided some great scientific context to help um, explain some of the things that uh, Lindsay and Tom were talking about. That's a short 14 minute video that was really well done, uh, they did a great job. And also wanna say thanks to uh, Cliff Etzel of CE Visuals for producing that film. Uh, part two is going to be again, Tuesday, August 10th, uh, same time, six o'clock. Uh, these broadcasts will be on our YouTube channel and you can watch them at your leisure whenever. This is such a complex topic with so much to consider and so many variables as we've learned tonight. So. We wanted to give it the time and space that it merits uh, because there's just so many things involved with it. And then lastly, I wanted to make a plug for our annual celebration, which will be coming up uh, the last week of September. Uh, we are doing things a little bit differently this year. We're having a week of celebration, which will feature a few outdoor engagement events or tours that folks can register to sign up for and get outside and get to mingle with other folks but in smaller, uh, hopefully safer groups of around 25 to 30. And then that will culminate probably around the end of the month uh, with a live virtual event where we will have uh, award, uh, give out awards to folks in the watershed, elect board members, 
and give out prizes. So stay tuned for our website and newsletter to learn more about that. Thanks again to Dave and Glenn. Really appreciate your time. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Have a great night.